Greetings, friends. And sorry for the delay. I had a technical glitch on my end, but I think it's resolved. So let me just welcome everyone. Uh, let me welcome you to the Future Transform. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm your host and cat herder for the hour. And uh, if you could just take a second to, if you haven't done so already, just quickly run to the chat box and introduce yourself. Just say uh, who you are and where you're from. If you know what that is, I'll explain in just a second. But for right now, Christopher, let's go on with the introduction. So if you haven't seen this before, if you haven't been here before, you should know the Future Trends Forum is the discussion-based spinoff from the Future Trends and Technology Education Project. That's a monthly research report which takes a look at trends in technology and education. We've been looking at these for years. We track about 86 of them right now. In fact, the new report should be out due tomorrow morning. So if you haven't seen it already, go to ftte.us, take a look, sign up. Uh, we'll be glad to have you. Now, another thing you should know about this project uh, let's go over the next slide, please. Uh, is that it is a transnational project, but it is also part of the Future of Education Observatory. Um, so let me just explain those two things. The Future of Education Observatory is a multimedia effort that I lead, uh, trying to understand the future of education. And to this end, we blog, we have the FTDE report, we have a book club, and we have this forum. And the participants in it are from all over the world. So you'll see today that we have people from multiple continents, multiple nations, and we've had participation from all over the planet. This is vital if we're going to be talking about the future of education, to have a transnational perspective. And we'll see that when we talk to Roland about how innovation might play out differently depending on where you are. Now, over the next slide, please. Now, to explain what we do, we have to first thank all the people who helped make it possible. So I want to thank a few of our sponsors. Uh, to begin with, I want to thank NizerNet from New York State, uh, a nonprofit that uh, basically helps connect all that state's universities, colleges, libraries, and museums to the internet. We're very grateful to them for their support. We're also grateful to Shindig because Shindig makes available this technology we're using now. And if you haven't been here before, if you haven't been here for a while, let me explain a few of the ways that you can interact with us, including our guest. So to begin with, where I am uh, is called the stage. And this is where everyone can be seen and can be heard. Everyone participating can hear and see what I'm doing. You can see these slides here, which we're gonna get rid of in a minute, and we'll be able to as well see our guests and anybody else who wants to join us. Now below us is what is the audience, or what I think of as the participant swarm, where you can see dozens of people at a time interacting. Um, every person is represented by uh, an icon, uh, either by a silhouette, as with say, uh, Phil Cameron, or with uh, a video. Uh, right now we have uh, Blessing, for example, who is smiling at us. Um, and if you want to talk to any of those people, you can simply double click on their icon. And if they want to talk to you, your two icons will snap together like Lego bricks and you can have a private audio visual bubble for your own conversation. Now, if you want to interact with everybody else, there are a lot of other ways to do this. Let me direct your attention to the very bottom of the screen. There's a white strip going across it that has a bunch of different icons. Look to the far left edge of it. On the far left, you'll see what looks like a couple of heads and the number, which right now reads 51. That'll give you a link to everybody, who, if you click on it, will give you a link to everybody who's in on this conference right now. So you can just scroll through, kind of like a file strip, every single person who's here. So that'll give you a sense of the total population. Now to the right of that is a little button uh, that looks kind of like a cartoon dialog box. If you click that, it'll pop up a dialog, it'll pop up a chat box for the 18 or so people that are here. So um, thank you for asking, Don. I'm stabilizing my laptop right now. Um, you can ask questions, you can share comments, you can share URLs. This is one way to talk to people that are in, your, uh, in the same spot in this Shindig environment with you. So if you haven't done so already, please just take a minute to say hello and say where you're from. So we've already seen people here from uh, Kentucky, Seattle, New York, California, upstate New York, New Jersey, Tennessee, Houston, Albany, New York, and me from Vermont. Now, there's two other ways to interact, also on that white strip. Next to the cartoon dialog box, you'll see a little question mark with a circle. If you click that, you'll have a chance to type in a comment or a question that you'd like for us to show to the entire group and for me to read out loud. Easy thing to do. And next to that is a raised hand. If you click that, that tells us that you're ready to join us up on stage. It's really easy to do. If you have your microphone working and your camera working and you are in an environment where you feel comfortable speaking out loud, 
click that. You can join us. We'll bring you on stage and you can have a conversation with Raul and myself and everybody else. Really easy to do. Okay. All those are different ways that you can interact with this community. That is what this is all about. These slides are only minor. Now, not minor is our last source of support from Patreon. If you haven't seen Patreon, it's a crowdfunding site which supports creative people making stuff. So if you go to patreon.com slash Brian Alexander, you'll see dozens of people, almost 100 now, who contribute as little as a dollar a month just to keep this future of education research project going. So if you haven't been there before, please go to patreon.com slash Brian Alexander. Check it out. We'd be grateful to you for any of your support. Now, that's how the technology works. That's who supports us. That's where we came from. Let's dig into this week's guest. I'm very, very pleased to have Roland Moe here. I mean, formerly, Roland is a director and founder of Seattle Pacific University's Institute for Academic Innovation. He's a professor there. And there's two features about this that you want to know. One is that for years, Rollin has been famous, if not notorious, as a critic of the very idea of innovation and the, and the excitement and cult around innovation. So this makes it ironic that his job is to implement and support and even expand innovation. So I want to hear about that. The second point, which I never get tired of repeating, is that Rollin was a student of mine years ago in his undergrad days. So he is used to me yelling at him, showing him things, making him feel awkward and exhilarated, hopefully at the same time. Uh, I'm just pleased as punch that he has reached this far, his career has been this brilliant, and I'm glad to share all of you with him. So welcome, Roland. Can you hear and see us okay? I can. Thanks for having me, Brian. Excellent. Uh, my pleasure. My pleasure. I'm so glad that you could be here. Um, let me just begin with, this is a question I ask everybody, uh, what do you do right now in your work? What do you spend most of your time working on besides having an awesome time? Thank you. Um, so my position is, as you mentioned, as the director of academic innovation at Seattle Pacific University. So the goal of that space for us is to create a culture of innovation on campus. And as we'll talk about going forward, um, yeah. it's an interesting place yeah. when we're thinking about problematizing academic innovation, uh, which is what I do in my in my critical and scholastic work. Um, but my job is to come alongside faculty, staff, administration, and we're hoping soon students when thinking about teaching and learning, having an idea. So often in the bureaucratic structure, a good idea goes as far as a faculty member or anyone working in the system can take it on their own. Uh, not understanding the manner in which to engage support systems, not understanding that potentially support systems work uh, for these various purposes. And so we have a lot of energy and enthusiasm and excitement around what's possible with teaching that hits a wall or goes as far as it can go without any further support. So it's my job to come in and assist with that, whether that's going to be with research, whether that's with development, implementation, assessment. Um, in many cases, hopefully operations, if we have something that someone has come up with that is successful. Uh, I'm also welcome to work on projects that I believe are beneficial and find faculty, staff, administrators, community members to come alongside that. Um, the reason that we do this is we had an innovation task force that started about four years ago uh, to look at uh, efficiency, essentiality, and effectiveness on campus. Essentiality. Those three E's were essentiality, yes, um, is something that we're doing essential to our mission and what teaching and learning means uh, on campus. Our mission is to create students of competence and character. Uh, so is what we're doing actually meeting that or are we saying that but producing other other events. Um, so in that creation, our realization at Seattle Pacific was innovation was a faculty driven affair. Um, to be a student centered campus, we needed to be supporting faculty in what they were doing in their day to day operations. Um, there's a famous line that goes around on my campus, which is, did you earn your degree to do what you're doing right now? Did you earn your degree to be working through the financial ledger? Did you earn your degree to be uh, posting things in the spreadsheet? Did you earn your degree to be doing the administrivia? Um, and in many cases, that's no, but what we have to think about is in systematic learning, we have to somewhat be experts in all sorts of domains. So I think of Shulman's uh, pedagogical contact knowledge, uh, content knowledge, which turns into Mishra and Kaler's TPAC. Um, we have to have some understanding of all the different things we touch. So what I do in innovation is figure out if there's an idea, what are all of the domains that need to be addressed and how can we bring those people together? Um, 
in hopes that soon we can turn this into a everyday operation for the campus. That sounds like a fantastic thing, like a kind of open skunk works or um, uh, innovation uh, engine uh, running for uh, the whole the whole institution. How many faculty are there, roughly? So we have about 250 uh, tenure track full-time faculty. Um, we are a fortunate institution that uh, our age, our adjunct and contingent labor force is primarily specialized. So we yeah. are um, able to have yeah. adjuncts come in for music, art, special yeah. courses yeah. in you know business specific fields. Um, and we support adjunct and contingent labor with the institute. That was one of the things that was very important mm. to me, that all members Good of the community you. can access what we're, what we're able to do. Um, so yesterday we had a, um, a round table in my office uh, in this kind of faculty affairs center we're building. Uh, we had 80 faculty members come by, which is remarkable to have a third of your full-time uh, faculty be able to come in and just engage. Now we had free pizza. So, I mean, I'm sure that was driving some of the numbers <laughs> there, but uh, you know, an opportunity people, you know, having this expertise, you want someone to listen to you. And it's nice to be the person on campus who gets to say, rather than saying, no, we can't do that because of bureaucracy, because of policy. Rather, I get to right. say, hmm, how could we do this? Let's think about it together. Now, I, I, I've got to ask a few things around this. And then, uh, and, and friends, please, if you have, as you come up with questions thinking about Rollins work, please uh, don't be shy. Again, remember to use either the chat box or the uh, raised hand to join us or the uh, question mark to throw us a text. Um, one question is, do you also have uh, an educational technology um, uh, department or something similar to that? So I moved into this position. So we've had this institute for two years. I came from our educational technology department. Uh, so we had an educational technology and media department, which was what attracted me um, to this uh, particular position was the uh, marriage of ed tech and multimedia. You don't see that at a lot of places. Um, moreover, the relationship of all departments on campus. The first thing I heard when I interviewed four years ago from IT was, listen, we're all, we're all working together to better student learning. We just have to look at it from different perspectives, which was very refreshing to start off with uh, computer information mm -hmm. systems on a positive foot. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so I network regularly with ed tech, with the library, with computer information systems, um, various senior leadership on different topics. Uh, it's my job to kind of be that connective tissue across the campus, um, have a foot in everything that's going on so that if somebody is thinking about something, they're not spinning their wheels on something that's already happened or already was realized would not work, um, and then put people together on like-minded projects. You're um, in a really striking position. Um, in fact, I want to ask you one more question about that. And, and as I do, we're going to bring up uh, Tom Hames from Houston, and he's going to have a question as well. So, uh, Christopher, if you can just start beaming him up. The quick question is, as a professor, are you doing any teaching in addition to this? Uh, at this point, I am not. Um, when I came in, I was, and I have an interesting space. Uh, so my doctorate is in educational technology. And so I have taught classes with uh, the School of Education. However, I caucus with uh, art and film studies uh, on our campus. My master's degree and my practical work prior to education was in film. So uh, with the new position um, and between the support of faculty as well as some larger projects that we're working on, there has not been an opportunity for me to regularly engage in a course. And there's also a, a lot of travel that goes with the position. So we are still very yeah. much a face-to-face, -face, uh, high-touch university. Mm -hmm. So our the expectations for online learning are very different. And it's we don't necessarily have the pathway for me to be teaching classes primarily online in the manner that the students are accustomed to. We have to forage that a little bit. Oh, oh very interesting. Thank you. That's that's a deeper question than I thought it was. Um, let, me, let me welcome Tom Hames. Uh, Tom, what's your question for, Hi, uh, for Rollin? Hi. So I was just kind of curious what your, um, that you were introduced as being a skeptic of the cults of innovation or whatever you want to call it. I'm, I'm just kind of curious what that, what that looks like in your head. I, I tend to agree with that a bit, but I'm, I'm interested to hear what you say. Uh, thank you for uh, that, that uh, you, it, like, like we were transitioning to the, to the right point, Tom, I appreciate that. Um, the, uh, I struggle with 
the social and cultural aspects of education, what's interesting to me as a scholar is kind of what we think about when we think about higher education to, uh, to appropriate Raymond Carver. Um, what are the unsaid things? What are the assumptions that are happening that we all go along with that maybe necessarily don't play out? And that's interesting in mass media, but that's also interesting in the field. So I became very interested in this topic in 2012 with the MOOC mania, um, the year of the MOOC and the rotting tree and revolu revolutionizing the university, the tsunami that was going to come alongside this. Uh, and looking at that mass media energy versus the literature and research on distance education, on where the MOOC had originally been with 2008, uh, the history of educational film, the history of educational television, there was a lot of disparity between those two places. And so my dissertation, I, came, I come from K-12 in education. Uh, prior to higher education, I served six years as a technological director for a school for students with learning disabilities. So the MOOC is actually what transitioned me to a, a great interest in higher education. Um, and the kind of being a critic of the common assumptions we had on that topic. So as MOOC mania fell off a cliff in 2013, I started seeing innovation replace that mania. So we were constantly talking about we need to innovate and be innovative and have innovativeness in our spaces. And when you keep hearing a word over and over again that no one is defining in its in the terms, you start to wonder what is what's going on there. So there's a remarkable history that's written about the term innovation by Benoit, Benoit Godin. Uh, it's called Innovation Contested. Uh, it's a Rutledge book. And he traces the term 2,500 years back to uh, Plato and Aristotle, who looked at it as an ambivalent political term, uh, which they oh. said, you know, uh, Aristotle said, Plato is an innovator, but I am not. Innovation is the, uh, is, is the way of people with folly who are having new ideas without having considered the old. Uh, Plutarch was the same way, very ambivalent about the concept. Then it moves into, uh, it, it, it goes away during the Dark Ages, comes back in in the Renaissance as a pejorative. So um, during the trial of King Charles I, King Charles I is lobbying at Parliament, you are innovators. And they're saying to King Charles, no, you are an innovator. Uh, this was a term that was a non-concept historically. So it was something that you said to be negative, but there was no meaning behind it. It was just a descriptive term, a, a simulacrum almost. So it's very interesting to see that 500 years ago, this was a pejorative and today it is a superlative. Um, and the real interesting thing for me is it was French socialism that was the bridge between that uh, in the in the 19th century. The other thing that's interesting is we've taken innovation, which was political or religious or social or technological, and in the last 40 years, we've conflated it. So that innovation now, when we talk about it in, in traditional discourse, means technological change for social good. And historically, that hasn't been the definition. You would need a descriptor in front of innovation to understand what we're talking about so that it's not just novelty for the sake of novelty. So all of this is to say we have this problematic term that we're using blindly in many cases. Um, so my work is one, to recognize that, that here's this word that innovation I don't think you necessarily know what it, what you're saying when you're saying it, uh, but it's driving policy, it's driving grants, it's driving funding. You are a director of innovation. I'm a director of innovation. Uh, this is this is a movement, and so how do we get in control of that movement and start with a critical space to talk about what we mean here, but then think about the positive benefit we could have coming from that. So. Uh, I've been, I, there's a book chapter coming out in a book out of uh, OSU Press, uh, The Business of Innovating Online, and I was asked to write kind of the history for that, to think about, we're going to have a whole book about the practical aspects of innovation, but we can't start that without defining our common terms and understanding that there are some problems with this. Um, you think about innovation hubs, I'm, I'm kind of now going on a tangent, but you think about innovation hubs. These cities like Seattle, Portland, Oregon, uh, Boston, Austin, Texas, uh, that are driving innovation. And we measure that by patents. But when you see population growth, the three innovative clusters that have rising populations right now significantly are Austin, Texas, Portland, and Seattle. And whether this is causal or correlational, uh, they are also of the top 10 uh, population growth cities they have the lowest number of uh, minority populations growing. And in the case of Austin, Texas, they're actually seeing a decrease in minority populations. So whereas Columbus, uh, Columbus, 
Ohio is seeing a growth of 25%, and that's matched by minority populations. Austin's seeing 14% growth, but negative 5% uh, for minority growth. So when we're using wow. innovation as this blind positive <clears throat> term, are we really thinking about what that actually is meaning in practice in many cases? And then we're educators. How do we appropriate that? Um, I think about Uber for education or Netflix for education, now innovation for education. Usually when we have that addition to a concept, it's not a positive thing that's coming out of that. So how do we go back to the history and like we had technological in innovation and social innovation, really define academic innovation so that it can stand on its own and be the positive that maybe not all innovation is? Yes. Eliza, well, I like to say innovation is people. Um, yeah, but, like Soylent uh, Green. Yeah. yeah, like Soylent Green. Um, the... Uh, <laughs> Um, yes, two, two quick comments. The, please, please. The, the, yeah, it's a great answer. The, the MOOC is the last gasp of the old educational model, and, uh, and director of innovation is an oxymoron, and I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Very well said. Well, that, I think uh, in, in many ways, friends, uh, Roland is uh, in a really unique position. Um, I mean, just you know, listen carefully to how he was able to seamlessly blend institutional analysis with detailed textual analysis about the word innovation, where it comes from reaching all the way back to the ancient period through philosophy and criticism up to the present. But there aren't many people like that. Um, and I, I think that's pretty fortunate. Um, I, I did, I did learn from you. So. <laughs> well, that's, that's not as fortunate, but, um, but, but that's, that's very good. Um, and friends, if you haven't been here before, um, what we just did with Tom, a beaming up on stage, is that easy to do. Uh, so if you have a mic and camera working and you want to talk with Roland, even if you might be intimidated either by his fire or by his tie, nevertheless, we can give you the technology to put you up there face to face. Uh, and that's, you know, so that's for everyone, uh, including uh, Blessing just had a great... Um, uh, we had a comment in the chat box, which I want to bring back. And, and Tom, stick around for a second. About okay. This. Uh, this was Jonathan Ports, uh as the term innovation has been appropriated by neoliberalism. That is, in the, in the contemporary sociopolitical ideology of, uh, of free markets, is innovation the? I think you're going to say yes, but I want to I want to bring that up there. So uh, you broke up there for just a second, Brian. But I guess the what I heard was uh, innovation and neoliberalism. Um, and it's very interesting. So it was in the mid 1970s that we conflated social and technological innovation and suddenly mm. just had innovation uh, in education mm. that most notably comes out in the 1990s with Clayton Christensen uh, taking mm -hmm. Sean Peter's creative destruction and turning it into uh, disruptive innovation. Um, so I, I, you know, I definitely would see that space in existence historically. Uh, and then we do just have this, this rallying call around. We need to innovate. We need to be innovative. Um, my university was the same way. Uh, I'm very fortunate to be somewhere where we took the time and said, what does that mean? We're going to be innovative. What does it mean to do that? And I'm seeing a lot of that in these innovation centers that are coming up. Um, it's interesting. It's, it, we could say we're behind the times, that the real peak of innovation was four or five years ago. If you were to do an n-gram on Google, you would see that innovation is, is in usage actually declining uh, at this point, whereas right around the... Uh, the 2012, um, 2013 MOOC mania was when it was when it was growing. Um, but what Tom mentioned about innovation is people. Uh, that is the way that we have defined it at Seattle Pacific University, that we're grounding it in the efforts of faculty. Um, there is a link to what George Koros uh, has in the innovators mindset about innovativeness um, in that space. And what we're trying to do for academic innovation, at least at Seattle Pacific, is ground that in uh in a, in a culture around the campus, but also in policy and what it looks like to do that. Um, because it becomes problematic if mindset is going to be the entire, the, the entire juxtaposition of our space, then it's all on the individual to be an innovator and good projects aren't going to occur unless we have a systematic approach where we're bringing multiple people hmm. into what we're doing. So there's almost uh, two different models. There's the kind of romantic or heroic model of innovation where we have the lone innovator working away versus the social or network sense where uh, knowledge and innovation ideas actually come from the interaction of people. 
And I always feel like it's a bit of revisionist history to have the romantic idea of the innovator, because again, this wasn't a term that we were using in a positive sense really until about 40 years ago. Um, it would have to be technological innovation, and that was about a product or social innovation, which was about a process. So we've, we've kind of, you know, it, we've kind of invented this space where we romanticize innovation. Um, and I think about there's a New Yorker cartoon that I, I need to get my hands on again, but it says something along the lines of, thank you, Don, for that wonderful pr uh, innovative presentation. Now let's all vote to do things the same way. So despite the romanticism, <laughs> Despite the romanticism of this topic, we maybe value it as a belief we wish to have, but when put into practice, we're afraid to really engage what that means. And so does that mean innovation is in itself a nothing concept or just a hooray concept without movement forward? Um, for me to do my job, uh, for academia to move forward in the way that it wants to, it can't be. Otherwise, Otherwise, the MOOC will be the final, uh, the final hurrah, not just for the old system of education. Um, if you watched the State of the Union address in the United States, uh, very clear that how we value public education and higher education, uh, what comes oh. out of the golden age from the 40s to the 70s and the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, that's not the feeling anymore. And it's not the feeling for the politicians and it's not the feeling for the pundits. There's a lot of space for a political party to come along and say, higher education and compulsory education is important. Because right now we're saying, well, we need to value workforce education. We need to value training, job skills. MOOCs capitulated to that. Um, and that is important. But there isn't a political party in the United States making a case for why higher education in the way we thought of it during the golden age is important today. There's a lot in what you just said. I, I want to I grab onto some of it, but we have a few people who have been raising their hand to participate. So let's... Um, Let's uh, first flash up this question. Uh, this is coming from Scott Robeson, who asks, is there also a center for teaching and learning on campus at your campus role? Hello, Scott. Question. Um, so on our campus, not defined in that way. Uh, and again, this is always going to be administrative. Where do different resources go? Who is Who owns what on a campus? So we have a center for scholarship and faculty development. We have an educational technology and media a section. So, and then we have IT, which is computer information systems. So questions about the nuts and bolts of using technology often go to IT. How that manifests in the classroom goes to our educational technology and media. And then the more longitudinal professional development uh, work on scholarship synthesis of faculty affairs goes to that center for scholarship and faculty development. I'm very interesting. While I reside in that Center for Scholarship and Faculty Development, my reporting line is a dotted line. So I have a supervisor who mm. I report to on day-to-day -day operations, but we created an advisory board that I meet with quarterly and say, this is what I'm doing. Does this fit with what the university sees for innovation? And how does that need to change? How does what the university sees need to change? And what can I do to address that? Scott, that's a, a, an elegant question that really probed into the uh, structure here, uh, both in terms of innovation, but also how uh, uh, how this naturally works. Um, we have, uh, thank you for that. Uh, we have a question from Phil Katz, uh, who asks, do small colleges talk about the value of the anchor of mission? Or I'm sorry, how do small colleges talk about the value of the anchor of mission without sounding anti-innovative? That's a that's an excellent thing to consider. Um, I can only speak for what we do. Well, so my, my doctorate was at Pepperdine. And at the time of the MOOC in 2012, as I was working on my dissertation, it was serendipitous. Our provost was in a longstanding back and forth with Clay Shirky. Uh, Shirky, who wrote uh, Napster, Udacity, and uh, I forget what the, what the title was, but he wrote about the MOOC in 2012 um, and said, this is, this is going to change education. And while it didn't change it directly the way he had spoken of, I think a lot of what's in that, uh, that article indirectly was addressed. And our provost at Pepperdine, which had been doing online education for over 20 years, uh, took a different approach, which said, based on our mission at Pepperdine um, about really being a high touch institution, and that's across undergraduate and graduate courses, how are we going to reconcile the move online? And this is how we've done it. And it works for us, but we can't think about, you know, think about scale, we can only think about it scale in a, in a local contextualized manner. So mm -hmm. I think that mission is for us at Seattle Pacific, what drives us. So, you know, and, and, and the mission is very general, students of competence and character. 
how does that relate to technology? How does that relate to, you know, for uh, klaxon sounding 21st century skills? Um, what it's what I find I'm doing with faculty is often saying we have an idea and we see it in relationship to the mission. How does that fit into process and policies at the university? And often we get to a, a day of reckoning. We get to a point of saying, this is what we believe in, but this is what the mission says. So either we need to adopt this and figure out how it's going to work, or we need to think about what that mission is. Uh, I think most universities are finding uh, this is a difficult thing to do in a time of academic austerity. Uh, how do you fund mm -hmm. the things that you believe in? How do we have places like College Promise uh, at a time that many universities are continuing to raise tuition and see the uh, the relationship between uh, the financial aid and the tuition continue to grow? So the percentage of financial aid that students are getting, the discount is continuing to grow while tuition grows. Uh, and then you want right. to be funding these really authentic learning engagements for students. Uh, it's easy to pick on the climbing wall and the infinity pool. Uh, for the most part, we're spending money on broadband so students have access to fast internet so they can build projects uh residence halls that exist so somebody can live in them not uh you know not things that are relics out of the out of the 1950s faculty health insurance uh that's one of the biggest drivers of why tuition is going up is paying for insurance for for faculty and staff those are things we all kind of agree with so how do we how do we recognize all those things i don't have the answer but I think that it's it's vital to be having that conversation constantly and recognize that mission as a statement might not be fluid, but the way that we're manifesting it will be. That's a great answer, Phil. Um, I, um, I, I hope that Roland, that's uh, that's a seminar level answer. Thank you. Uh, that really dives in great detail. I had another question uh, or another raised hand. Um, was there. Uh, this is again from Scott. Uh, Scott Robinson wants to know what do you see as the advantages or disadvantages of uh, keeping? I'm sorry. What? Well, that just changed. Sorry. Uh, when innovating the classroom, in what ways are assessments included? This is from uh, Myron Williams. So, uh, Myron, I'm going to answer yours first, and then Scott, uh, I'll come back to that because um, assessment is really at the key of academic innovation, in my opinion. If we're going to think about innovation as people, it has to be localized, it has to be contextualized within an environment. Uh, and that means that your assessment has to be thought of in the same way. So you might be building different instruments, different metrics, different measures. Uh, when we have an innovative project on campus, whether it's something a faculty member comes with, whether it's something the president comes with, or whether it's anywhere in between, uh, I ask four questions. What do you want to do? Why do you want to do it? What is the short-term goal and what's the long-term objective? And if we can answer those four questions, I can figure out whatever paperwork we need to do to get the funding, to get the policy. Because once Ooh. we know long and short term and the driver, then we can engineer what the assessment metric is. How are we going to measure if this was valuable? And then what is the, what's the point in which we're going to be able to then adopt it? So this is valuable, but it's not statistically significant enough for us to put into day-to-day -day operations. Um, and then usually what happens is that there's a design process. It's an iterative design that goes into this. We run a test. Uh, we do an implementation of the intervention. We see it. We realize there's some things we didn't recognize going in, and we have to make some some changes before we run it again. Um, so assessment is, is vital, and it's important to be flexible in what that looks like. And I think so much of the reporting and the analytic push with with data and putting things into our spreadsheets. Um, mm. I'd really like to see more mixed methods and qualitative individuals mm. involved in institutional research teams and in senior leadership and in institutions. Uh, we're fortunate again at Seattle Pacific University to have that, but if those those points aren't brought in, it's very difficult to value the innovation that's happening in many fields or many. Uh, pedagogical techniques that don't recognize and, and translate into numbers quickly. Um, to go to Scott's question, what's the benefit of uh, keeping things separate? Um, the, the positive of that is there's the opportunity to really grow expertise in various domains on campus. Uh, IT can focus on IT. Educational technology can focus on, you know, new trends there. Uh, scholarship and faculty development can focus on, you know, elements such as service learning or other, other uh, emergent trends that are happening uh, in scholarship and faculty development. And I can, you know, correlate with all of those places. Uh, what makes that difficult is you become 
you're at the whim of operations and budgets and protocols. So I have to always present, I don't, I, I'm a one man band. I have to present need that I'm going to go to a director. I'm going to go to a vice president and say, I need some of your staffing. I need some of your funding. Uh -huh. And here's the rationale that I see for that. Um, and in a time of academic austerity, that's difficult to do anywhere. Um, so if we're going to do something well, we need to do it we, if we're going to do something, we need to do it right. And I won't invest in projects if it's going to be uh, MacGyvered too much. So, Myron, Scott, two really, really good questions. And uh, again, thank you, Ron, for really teasing out the answers to uh, a few different angles, a few different directions. Um, and uh, Scott has a thanks for you. Uh, I don't apologize for nuts and bolts questions, Scott. Those are terrific. Uh, those are really, really good probes. Uh, and remember, the rest of you, you can see that um, for some of you, you aren't shy at all, which is great. Uh, so again, just uh, click the raised hand button if you want to join us like uh, like Tom did, or click the uh, question mark if you want to uh, flash a uh, question across the screen. And uh, again, the chat box, uh, we've seen a lot of conversation happening, at least in the one that I'm peeking into. Um, please keep sharing your thoughts. Um, I have an awful lot of questions myself, and uh, I want to make sure that uh, we don't miss any of yours. Um, your point, uh, Roland, about being a one man and um, having to do a lot of different work and having to draw on other people's resources and attention from within the institution gives rise to another question. And this is a this comes from a theme that's been running across the Future Transform for two years. What um, what role does interinstitutional collaboration play in your sense of innovation? How do you draw on forces beyond the walls of your campus? If you know, if you're going to be doing uh, work in higher education today, there are it's the the idea of the of the of the closed gated community, the the monastery where we 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 keep the records. Um, it's it's ridiculous to say education hasn't changed in a thousand years, but uh, too often I feel like we're um, intra rather than inter in in what we're thinking about the value that we have. So our students are going out into communities, local and global. Uh, our efforts are needing to go into the same things. Um, so being a one man band, that makes it difficult to get all of the outreach that's necessary. So there will be interesting projects that are happening. We have a very interesting thing happening with our school of business um, right now. And we have relationships on the outside in part because they were brought to us. Um, I don't know if we would have necessarily Ooh. had the bandwidth. And what's ended up happening is we've Ooh. created a 13 part film series uh, on, uh, uh, you know, that we're going to use as the catalyst for an open online course. We're gonna be teaching a course, uh, the School of Business is gonna be teaching this course for free um, starting in April, uh, shameless plug. But uh, <laughs> in the ballast of it is not a, not, a lecture -driven, not a lecture driven set of videos, but it's 13 case studies that are driving the conversation um, on this place. And it was a relationship mm -hmm. from the community that came in that made us open our eyes and say, we need to reach out to more of the community oh. on what we're doing. Um, there's only so much time that a one man, a one man shop can have. And if I'm not aligned with what the needs are from other departments, then I can only, right. you know, I, I can support and I can do a very good job of that, but it becomes difficult in really getting the, the tendrils out and engaging as much as, as I would say is necessary. Um, and being in a city like Seattle, I'm fortunate. There's a lot of interest. And um, while we have the University of Washington here in Seattle, there is a lot of interest in working with uh, with other colleges as well. So I'm fortunate people are coming to me. I wish I had more time to go to go to them. Well, that says a lot. I mean, you've got the example of the face-to-face -face or the immediate physical environment of Seattle, the Pacific Northwest are drawn. You have the pre-existing relationships from some of your faculty, which is great. Um, and I guess one more question to ask is what role does the computer have your media role in institutional innovation? Uh, you broke up there at the last second on that question. I'm sorry. Well, it must be a great question. Um, uh, can you at least uh, um, speak to the role of social media in uh, helping your uh, all right, so I got I, I did catch social media um, and how we work we work in in that space. Um, one of the things that is that we're we're trying to talk about uh, on campus and I think in general is the role of uh, the digital scholar, the public intellectual. What does that look like in the twenty first century? Um, I. I'm a, an advocate of open access. I'm an advocate of the open education movement, OER, uh, open science, open software. So 
thinking about social media in that regards, it's important to be considering it along the same way. Um, I'm also a proponent of Boyer's emergent models of scholarship. Um, and one mm. of the things I'm mm. leading in in service on campus around this, one of the things that I've noticed both at our university as well as many others, there was a Chronicle article about it several years ago, a lot of schools adopted Boyer as a a, th a thought leader for um, how scholarship should be. And so faculty handbooks and departments will say, we, we recognize all forms of scholarship. But if you dive into what's recognized, it actually capitulates much more to the scholarship of discovery. So I'm trying to, through social media, live out the manifestation of Boyer's, Boyer's model. So thinking about integration, teaching and learning, uh, service and being open in that way. So having conversations that would be that gray literature in various places, using blogs, using what Sherman Dorn called pre-argument scholarship, uh, putting ideas out there, teasing it off the community. Um, I would be remiss to say if it were not for social media, I would not be where I am today in, the, in my career. Um, I was a student at Pepperdine who was also working in K-12 education as, a, as an administrator. Um, I started asking people in the field in 2011 what they thought of MOOCs, and I was naive enough to ask big names. So um, on my dissertation, uh, I had P Peter Norvig from Google was one of the one of the 20 people who was a, a member of that. And I got Peter Norvig and I got I got the Peter Norvigs and Clay Shirkies of the world because I asked them. And uh, I just got mm. them on the right day. And so mm. that experience has been fortunate enough to how am I going to give back to that um, and share the same sort of public scholarship and thinking about this in a public good fashion. Um, so the work we do is open uh, at the institution. And you, you talked a lot about the synthesis between what I talk about foundationally at my school as well as the greater field. So our process for innovation grants is an open peer review process. Um, and I've I've adopted this somewhat from two places. One's going to be um, hybrid pedagogy and their open peer review process uh -huh. for their uh -huh. uh, for their articles. But then also uh, the way that Skyline College um, in South San Francisco, California, uh, does their innovation grants, which is if a faculty member is interested, we want to work with them. And so we're going to tease that out. And we do that publicly at Seattle Pacific. So a faculty member comes with an idea. I respond. We work back and forth until we find something that's going to work for the university. Uh, and then that's public record for everybody to be able to engage in. So in two years, when another faculty member says, I'm not sure how to write a grant, I can point them to what that experience yes. looks like. Nice. Uh, so you combine the social with the open. Uh, that's terrific. Uh, friends, we're down to about 10 minutes uh, with Roland. And so I want to make sure that you all have an opportunity to share your questions and comments. Uh, so again, remember to uh, click that raised hand if you want to join us on stage. Um, I think we have someone who wants to do this right now. So please bring them up, Christopher, if we can. And if you have uh, more questions, um, from, you have the uh, question mark and the chat box at your disposal as well. I think we have David Stone. David, welcome. Hello, oh, I can't hear him, I don't think. I think he's muted. David, uh, David you're I think muted. Like, uh, I think, uh, there we go. My question is, how do you move from these kind of projects or kind of test cases? Well, it looks like... Um, a whole bunch of us are having issues with connectivity right now. Uh, so David, very quickly, we turn this to a text question, which I can read out loud. How do you move innovative projects from one-off efforts to a long-term change in direction for the institution? Oh, that's, that's a great question, David. Excellent. And, and well, that's... Two of your four questions for people, don't they address that, the short-term goal and the long-term goal? Absolutely. But one of the things that comes out is how does that then manifest for the university? So I can work on a project with faculty members or a department or a school or college, um, and we can, we can address that, but there's going to have to be some sort of institutional change in order for that to go into day-to-day -day operations and processes. We have to think about staffing. We have to think about funding. Um, so addressing it from the beginning and having a record so we can show that, that, that aspect. Um, and then it really comes down to advocacy and really working with all elements of the university to understand the importance of doing this. And so I think about, you know, software changes. So a lot of, you know, universities that are moving LMS systems, whether they're moving from Blackboard to Canvas or moving from Canvas to Brightspace, moving from Brightspace to Blackboard. Um, 
you know, there's a, a process that goes into that. And the thoughtfulness in which all people are engaged is the is the manner in which you, you see the most success. So we have a um, you know, we, we have a, a flow chart of how that works. And it's not, you know, one of those direct, if you do A, then you can do B, C, or D. And if you chose C, then you go to J. But here are some questions that whereas we're in the idea stage so that we can be prepared for the development. And then when we're in the development stage, we can be prepared for the experiment. And when we're in the experiment pit stage, Whoa. we can be prepared for the assessment. And all of those spaces, as they come forward, um, we're taking notes and data so that I can give that to senior leadership at whatever level to show why that's important uh, to be a change. So in some places, we've been very fortunate and we've been able to adopt change very, very readily. In others, we've had all the data there and we just have not been able to get the funds to work because in order to do, do that staffing, we need to take from something else. And so that's where you have to make the tough decisions. Uh, but it's my job to give that innovative project the best coat of paint that I can and give it to the <laughs> folks who make the, make the financial decisions and hope that they can can figure it out. If they see the effort that I've put into working together and the faculty have put into it, you know, if it doesn't work, at least we have a thoughtful conversation about that. Mm. Mm. At the very least, I'm, I'm, I can't imagine not having a thoughtful conversation uh, at this stage. Um, that's a great question, David. Uh, and, and Roland, you just outlined a, str a strategic structure for bringing this in for making even the smallest inquiry part of the larger larger process um so we have uh, again just a, a handful of minutes and i'm sure a bunch of you um have uh thoughts that you'd like to share um and i'm just looking here through all the participants and there's some people who have all kinds of ideas i know uh we have uh, renee uh we have roxanne uh, I think blessing. If you're still here, you had a great question you wanted to ask, and we can bring it up however you like it. Um, and anybody else who wants to join us, uh, please feel free. Again, uh, if you uh, can't use the uh, camera, uh, please feel free to use the other uh, technologies on the white strip. Uh, Tom returns with a text question. He says, "Often the problem with senior leadership is getting them to understand the paradigm. How do you handle that?" Yeah, that's a good question, Tom. You know, I think the the it's going to go back to that academic innovation is people. Um, I've got a TED talk ready, uh, so thank you, Tom, for, uh, <laughs> for that. Um, but academic innovation is people, and so how do you? We're so used to being in our structures and what's expected from our job and our reporting lines and these various spaces. How do we remember that the element to education is human? That's the reason we've struggled so much in trying to. Um, do computer-based personalized learning and automated learning and next, you know, what Richard Kulata calls next button instruction. Um, so how do you break the, whoever it is at whatever level, whether it's senior leadership or um, academic support, how do you break out of that paradigm of what is traditionally expected and recognize the human element of, of what you're working on? Um, I had a faculty member come yesterday uh, to this, this forum we had and say, is it innovative? It's not technological, but would it be innovative to pay for lunch so faculty could go with students that have recently graduated and take them to lunch and remember what it's like to have that gap between graduation and finding your career, or your profession, and remembering mm. you get two weeks off mm. or, you know, a lot of, mm. uh, you know, underemployment. And just to understand that, we talk about, uh, you know, open textbooks as these cost savings of hundreds of dollars, and that's important. Um, there, what are the other things that we're not thinking about that we could do? Uh, and maybe having that direct relationship to an alumni who's out for two years, hasn't found their first career, hasn't found that first job, is working, you know, mm -hmm. the stereotype is a barista, mm -hmm. but, you know, Uber driver underemployment. Mm -hmm. Take that person out to lunch and just listen. Say, how are you? What's what's happening? Um, that'd be difficult to do at a large university. Um, but potentially one of the benefits of being at a small university is to be able to do something like that. And if you are at the University of Wisconsin, what is the thing that you can do to reach out? Um, I know if I was, you know, if I was getting a phone call from one of my alma maters, I would much rather them ask me, how are you for that rather than how are you? We're looking for a hundred dollars. Right. Right. Um, that's a very comprehensive answer. Uh, again, Tom, another fine question from you. I, um, I've got a, while everybody else is revving up for their last minute question, uh, let me just you know, ask one more of, uh, of my own. We haven't spoken about technology per se. 
we've been speaking about institutional change, we've been speaking about organizations and psychology. Uh, I'm curious in your work so far in this position, are there any particular technologies that loom large? Uh, have, have have you found a particular uh, method or technology that really is a go-to tool for people or is it just all over the map right now? Yeah, no, I, that's, I try and be uh, tool agnostic um, in as much as mm-hmm. I do because I find I find in training and professional development and in, in teaching, uh, if I focus, so we, we recently moved to Canvas. And when I focus on training for Canvas, I'm able to do the computational things for faculty. So I can show how you create a module, how you do the test bank, how those pieces work out. Uh, sure. And, you know, was, I, I mentioned Schulman's pedagogical content ner- knowledge earlier, and he mentioned not why, but how. Well, it's important. We say we can say not why, but how if we've addressed the why. And I think too often these easy to do it yourself videos are only focused on the how. And so my interest is sure canvas is the tool of the day. I'm going to show you that, but I'm going to, as, as I'm leading you through building your question bank, why is that a good thing? Why is this different than the system we were using before? Um, and so it's kind of a voiceover that goes on top of those instructional tools. And so it has to be uh, a little more meta, a little, little higher of a flyover. Uh, so, you know, if a faculty member is, uh, you know, changing or working off the grid, um, I'm the innovator. So I have to be willing to support those people who are engaging LTI that we don't support as enterprise systems. Um, one thing that I will say, uh, I'm reluctant for when technology is at the benefit of the, of the institution or the faculty member in a much, to, to a much greater extent than it is for the student. So, if a faculty hmm. member is coming with a technology that is going to help their administrative duties or, or the administration is coming with one of those things, I want to make sure that the benefit for the student is evident and as strong, if not stronger. Otherwise, is what we're doing it for doing it for the right reasons? That's a good question. Uh, and that's a really good answer um, for technology agnosticism. Uh, you really ground that very, very deeply. Uh, friends, this is your last chance. Uh, if you have a question that you want to bring up, um, Otherwise, uh, I have one last question to, uh, to close out the day. Um, not seeing anybody else, let me ask, where do you see innovation education going in the medium term future, say for the next one to five years? You know, do you think, uh, you mentioned the Ngram where innovation instances were beginning to drop. Do you think it will continue to drop and become a, a forgotten relic of business history? Uh, or do you think it will mutate into something new? So... Um, I, I knew this question was coming, but I'm still not prepared to answer it. Uh, the, <laughs> so I am in the middle, I work with the online learning consortium. Um, I'm going to give them a shout out. Uh, they were thoughtful enough to create a space in their innovate conferences. This is the third year of their rebranded ET4 online as innovate. And for three years, we've had a critical space that's been embedded in the conference called the innovation installation. So in 2016, we looked at the past of innovation as a museum installation. In 2017, we looked at the presence by bringing in uh, the present by bringing in uh, experts to talk about current issues of the day. This year in April, we're going to have six experimental short films looking at potential futures of uh, academic innovation. So some dystopic, uh, some, you know, much, much more practical. Um, so in thinking about that uh, and what Scott mentioned about these centers for teaching and learning, my, my fear is as we adopt more, as, as more institutions are able to create innovation spaces, that innovation gets conflated directly with the Center for Teaching and Learning and the responsibilities of maintaining the LMS uh, or accreditation aspects or other perfunctory tasks that we do in day-to-day operations. And now we just have a different title in order to do that. Um, the freedom uh, that, or the, the ability to be nimble uh, that comes with that sort of thinking and recognize it and ground it in the culture of the institution. Um, mm. If we're not thoughtful mm. about how we assign these places, I do worry about what innovation becomes there. Um, with the, like I mentioned, the State of the Union address, um, I'm concerned about how we think about higher education uh, and financially, we're going to have to be addressing that. I do see a disparity between how we talk about education as practitioners, but maybe we're not paying attention to the financial realities of, of what we're doing. Um, that has to be in the same way we have to think about assessment in any implementation we put forward. We have to think about the financials of, of what is this going to do. And I'm the kind of person who says, if, we, if you can't do it right, then we shouldn't be doing it. And maybe we need to realign. Um, that's a very uh, downer ending. So 
what I will say is I'm very excited about the energy that is around innovation um, and these centers that are opening up and bringing in very thoughtful people to be a part of it. Uh, And what I would ask is let's, let's make sure that it's not a bunch of people wearing members only jackets. Let's make sure that this is a group that uh, is all inclusive and, you know, not about titles, but you know, I'm, I worry, I don't like to call myself an innovator because, you know, I'm just doing the job that somebody would be doing in the, in the spirit of teaching and learning, uh, that title becomes, uh, mm. uh mm. elitist in many ways. And I, you know, want to just, I want to work with people and learn from them and build projects that can go forward. And I hope that mm. that's, if we can great do more contextualization of that, when we go to our conferences, I can say what I'm doing at SPU and Scott can say what he's doing at Portland state. And, uh, I saw Mike, um, can say, you know, what he's doing at Dartmouth and we can, we can build it all together. Well, that's a fantastic note to end on. That's not a downer at all because you bring this back to the question of resisting elitism, which reminds me of what you were saying about, uh, the leading uh, urban areas in the U S which are becoming, uh, less equitable. Uh, it connects to teaching and learning above all. And as, as uh, you and Tom Ames discovered, it's about people uh, and about focusing on uh, not so much on particular technology, organizational paradigm, but on how individual people uh, interact. Uh, Roland, we are unfortunately out of time. Uh, so I need to, with great regret, thank you and, uh, and hope we can bring you back on uh, later on so we can learn from you. Um, what's the quickest and easiest way for people to get in touch with you and learn more about your work? So, um, I am prolific on Twitter. Uh, so that my title is R Mojo, R M O E J O. Uh, my website that's over in the corner there, rollinmo.org. There's also profmo.com. Um, and then one piece that we're working on, as I mentioned with the online learning consortium, uh, we're digitizing the 2016 and 2017 installations. Uh, and that will be at defininginnovation.com. Uh, you can go there now and get a preview of, of what that's going to look like. But that's a 2,500 year problematization of innovation with the hopes of being able to move into more of this, this practical space. Friends, I hope you can still hear me. Um, I apologize for the uh, technical glitches. There seems to be some issue in the infrastructure in the state here. Um, I want to thank Rollin again so much for everything he's added and for everything he's said. Um, it's been very, very exciting to see and to hear him here. And I think everyone can learn a great deal from what Rollin's doing in a very innovative way uh, at his institution. Um, Rollin, were you able to tell people uh, where they can find you? Oh, yes. Um, there was a, someone asked about the Shulman. So I put a link uh, in the chat room that I'm in if you want to put that in other places. Uh, I'm at uh, rollinmo.org. I'm at profmo.com. Uh, and then about the defining innovation, that problematization of academic innovation over 2,500 years. We're digitizing all of that. It should be ready uh, in the spring. It's at defininginnovation.com. And uh, if you go there now, you'll get a preview of what that's going to look like. Excellent. And uh, if you haven't had a chance to look at the very um, bottom left edge of the screen, um, against the black background, you'll see a, a whole stack of uh, orange, yellow, amber buttons. And several of these are right for Roland and his work. So thank you again. We'll be in touch. Thank you. It was a pleasure. And now, friends, we're just past the end of the hour. So I need to uh, wrap up. And let me just mention a couple of things for uh, next week. Um, uh, first of all, uh, we have a fantastic guest next week. Uh, who is uh, coming to us from Denmark, uh, and she'll be talking to us about the future of education based on her scholarship, because this is what she's been working on. Uh, Ricky is a terrific scholar, uh, very provocative, who has fantastic ideas about where education could be going. That's next Tuesday, uh, February 6th, same time, 2 to 3, but next Tuesday. Well, don't worry, we'll get an announcement on the email list. Uh, another thing, too, is that on the uh, book club, we're starting our reading of Soonish, which is fantastic. It's a lot of fun. Uh, it's really uh, more than accessible to read. It's hard to stop reading. Uh, and we'll have the uh, next uh, three chapters of it there. So please join us on Monday. If you haven't gotten a copy of the book, I really, really recommend it. And if you want to learn more about the Future Trends work, go to ftte.us. If you want to learn more about Shindig, go to shindig.com. In the meantime, we'll see you online and we'll see you next Tuesday. Thanks again. Bye-bye.